Hi, we're here. Welcome, welcome to Friday Inspiration for Photographers. Um, and honestly, really, it's just inspiring for everyone. Let's let's face it. <laughs> Today, I have my friend and brilliant colleague, Lori Novak in the <laughs> house. All right. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited. I'm so excited too, because be you know, we're always talking privately and I'm like, God, we should be sharing this with the, with the world. <laughs> <we're> brilliant. <laughs> um, this is, for those of you that are new to this particular event, I can't decide, like people call it a podcast and then I start getting rashy because a podcast <laughs> sounds too official and too much like a commitment. And that makes me nervous. So I call it my live stream. I call it my chat. I call it my thing. I call it my... Friday inspiration for photographers, which is a mouthful, but there it is. And so um, every week we do something. Sometimes I'm just sharing my process, but lately I've been having friends over to chat over, you know, smoothie or coffee or tea or whatever. And, um, and Lori today is in the house. So Lori, for those of you who don't know her, I don't know why you don't know her, but you need to know her. Um, and we'll share her websites and everything. She's a photographer. She's a mentor. She's an author. She's brilliant. And uh, and I'm super, super stoked <laughs> that she's here. So, hi. Hi. I'm yeah. excited to be here. Am, yeah, me too. And, and those of you who are watching on Facebook, you can throw comments and questions in the chat. I'll refresh that page and check. And so, Lori, if I'm looking away, it's because I've got Facebook over here. And then we have a chat in Zoom of my subscribers who like, we get in a little early and chit chat and they all go on mute. And then we, uh, they throw questions and comments in there and they're always keeping me amused. So hi guys. <laughs> I love it when you're here. So, um, God, one of the, well, so interestingly, we're, so some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is gear, strangely enough, and uh, flow, just flow. And, um, and, and, and like, what am I trying to say? The thing about your vision, doing your vision, no matter what, but all that aside, what are you working on these days? Well, my, my biggest project this year is trying to sell work commercially, like, uh, through art agents, mm -hmm. agencies, uh, mm -hmm. deve uh, not developers, like designers and companies that work with hotels, hospitals, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been on my list for several years and I've never actually bitten the bullet and done it. And this year was was the year to do that. So I, I started that in January and it's a consistent, you know, you have to, to update every month, um, send out updated images and whatever, and just keep on top of it. So that's my main, my main thing. I just redid my website. I'm uh, kind of working on tours sort of in a half-hearted way at the moment, cause I'm not a hundred percent sure what I'm doing yet with my next year. So I really want to do Amsterdam. That's at the top of my list. So I need to start doing some planning for that. Yeah. Planning. And then you can always shift gears, you know, if it doesn't turn out, do something different. Yeah. And I, I do that pretty easily. So. Yeah, you do. You're, <laughs> you're, you talk about flow. I'm like, yeah. go with the flows. Go with the flow. How, how I operate. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty much Reorganize. how I operate. Reorganize the flow. So yeah. how is it going connecting? People are always curious about um, the art world. And because the thing that a lot of people don't realize about photography, I'm saying this to the general, um, our general audience is that you kind of like, there's, um, I don't know, silos, I guess you could say there's like, you know, online art, there's what you're doing with the dealers and so on and so forth. There's, um, you know, working with clients, there's, uh, you know, with art, there's teaching. And then there's a whole bunch of different avenues for that too. And each one of them take a different effort, a different yeah, yeah. setup. Yep. Yeah. It is all very different. It really is. And you're a, such a whiz at marketing and planning and all that <laughs> kind of thing that I I'm always fascinated by how you go about it. Cause I was working on that last year, took a break to get my retreat online, which we're doing now. And it's like, right. holy awesome. cow, it's so amazing. It's just cool. really amazing watching That's people. so cool. Yeah. Making the breakthroughs and stuff. Um, but I'm going to get back to it as well here pretty soon. So how are you going about it? Like what kinds, I mean, whatever you want to feel like you want to share, but no, it's fine. I, because I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, here to help people because yeah. that's one of the other things that I do and I had help someone help me. Right. So I have a friend who does this and, 
you know, appearances are one thing, right? You can think somebody is being very successful, but you, you don't really know. I mean, people think that I'm successful, but I don't really make that much money off of my photography. Um, I do okay, you know, I mean, it's like, it's okay, right, not yet. And, and it's, a, it's, it's not zero, how about that? <laughs> um, but but um, reaching out to people that do what you wanna do and ask questions is one of the, the best ways to find, you know, without spending all your time trying to research it and you know, invent the wheel again. Um, so what I've what I've done is I have a list of galleries, I have a list of art agencies or uh, designers, places that do interior decorating, and most mostly from just finding them on other people's websites, Instagram, looking for those kind of companies, um, and then getting contact information or just general, you know, contact information if you don't have anybody, anybody specific. And then I set up a sample document with sample images, my like artist statement, and then I have a whole separate document with pricing. Um, and I send that religiously every month with new images, you know? So I've sent out architectural two months. Last month, um, I actually sent out some automotive stuff because I thought, well, it's different, right? And you know, they might get a ton of architectural stuff or they might get a ton of, they probably get a ton of florals and travel photos, you know, from people. Right. And I thought, you know, they're they're decorating business offices, they're decorating for all different kinds of people. And there's people out there who are into cars. So, um, and my, my automotive work is very uh, fine art automotive. It's not like a picture of a whole car. It's usually hood ornaments or details of a car. Right. Um, so last month I shared that. This month I'll probably go back to a little bit of architecture and Chicago specific, possibly, um, and just see what happens. You know, I had one lady reply back to me after the first month, who doesn't even. She's like, I don't even sell work with photographers. I don't sell photography to my clients, but I love your stuff and I'm saving this. Keep sending me updates. I'm like, that's a win in my book. That she is may a never win. buy from me, but that's a win because she notice my work and it wasn't something she normally does. So yeah, yeah, I'll take that. And in the last three months, I've had a couple more say, you know, I'm looking for a new work, blah, blah, you know, and stuff like this takes time. You know, you're it not going to get a sale right away. They, mm -mm. you know, they're, they're working with different clients who want different things and it changes all the time. So I find too, that the, um, you know, photography is sort of like that was a case in point. Photography is often seen as in that world as like the ugly stepchild. Yeah. So so to be able to do something in a I'm going to talk about fine art and and a not that you can define it for real, but a way to think about what fine art is and how to because that is a different way to frame your work if your desired result or audience is what you're talking about or anything that relates to fine art even competitions or what have you um but what so when you're successful at it like that that's huge that's more than a win that's that's like a win of a personal and a genre yeah, <laughs> or a right just, right right that's huge and th and that's the kind of thing that could actually um change the way people think about photography too because it, it can be um, fine art in that way, it, it, but you, you would, really have to be conscious about creating that. Right. And you, you would think that after all these years, the people who originated the whole fine art photography thing, Edward Weston and that whole F64 group, you know, we're still fighting that. We're still yeah. trying to, to make ourselves fit in that world. Right. You know? Right. So, um, so fine art, like I usually tell people, I'm curious to know your take, because I usually tell people, when you're thinking fine art, you're talking about usually you could think of it as either one subject or two at most, or if there are two, they've got to be related to it, somehow qualifying one another and that it represents your specific point of view, your opinion, your take, your it's very personal. It's not a general here's a car. You know, it's like this is a thing about the car that I think is really cool. And I'm going to make a really special statement about this. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, how you I, look I, at it? I, I think so. I, I think that um, you have you have the whole, and I kind of group landscape into this because you have all those gorgeous, amazing images, right, mm -hmm. of sunrises and sunsets usually, um, or big, huge mountain ranges um, and that kind of thing. But I think that 
to get past that, you know, some of that reminds me of the old, uh, you know, you could used to buy and you still can if you go to cost plus world market or some of those places to buy the the art that they sell in places like Target or whatever, too. Right. It's kind of like the the manufactured stuff and they're right. pretty and they're nice, but they're not different. You know, and I think to, to take the, the the art a step further in photography to make it art is to make it different than the you know what's being manufactured in a factory or that they're producing 8,000 of these or 12,000 of these or however many they need in their stores. Um, and when you it, say different, like, you know, people get, then they eyes glaze over it. Like, well, how do I get, how do I make it different? I think part of it has to do with what I just said about making it a very, very, very go down the rabbit hole, make it really specific and really committed and really you, but then the other part of it is then finding the market and it doesn't just come to you. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And you, that's to, for me, that's been the hardest thing is finding my audience and I'm working on that too. That's something yeah. I'm also working on because, you know, there's people, everybody likes something different. You know, you, yeah. you can't sell the same thing to every person. It doesn't work that way, no matter what it is basically. Mm -hmm. So trying and you to have to find... develop the audience for each silo because I'm known because of Fujifilm, because of teaching, because of, I don't know, just sort of how it all unfolded for me in the photography world. Mm -hmm. I'm known more as a, you know, what do you think about this? And how can I, for photographers, like, how can I be a better photographer type, like under that heading? Right, right. So when I, right. when I like, and I do do fine artwork, but it's kind of come out of left field and there'll be like installations in a boutique hotel. And it's because I know this person, you know, it kind of comes through these other avenues right. so that when I want to expand on that, I, my audience that wants Fujifilm and how to be a better photographer, isn't so much interested in buying my stuff a few, right. will, but right. um, <clears throat> that's a whole other audience. And then people ask me about, well, like I get asked about art storefronts or, or places like that, that, maybe offer a way of um, learning how to crack the code on that market. And that's what makes, um, you know, like an art storefronts useful and valuable because they actually help you with the marketing. Right. And so right. I'm also going to mention smug mug because we're always talking about where to put our images and I use both, but for different things. And this is how specific it all is. So art storefronts is my fine art sales online. And then, right. you know, I can use it to refer clients to, or like the people that you're contacting to. Um, but smug mug is my, once I am working with a client and we're going through the image selection process and so on and so forth, smug mug is much easier to work with clients behind the scenes. Right. So right. they both specialize and I need them both. Can't do it without both. Right. Right. When it's funny, I was having a conversation with, uh, I write for photofocus.com and the editor and I were coming up with ideas and stuff. And we were trying to, um, work with one of our partners at the moment, which happens to be Fine Art America, which is a general site where people can uh, uh, upload their images to sell or just if you want to, you know, get prints and things. Mm -hmm. And and I said, you know, there's there's a difference. An art agent uh, actually told me one time that I should take myself off of there because it diminishes my work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I get it. And I did take myself down for a, several months. But then I needed it for another reason. And I thought, you know, I have all these other random images that I sell on there that I've been selling on there for like 10 years. Right. Those images aren't going on my fine art site. I'm not putting those on my website because they don't fit with my fine artwork. Right. But people are still buying them. Right. You know, I sell some images as stock. Well, those right. aren't going on my website. I was just going to say, it's so, like, you know, you still have like, you know, yeah. I don't go out and shoot only architecture all day long or only right. automotive all day long. I shoot all kinds of things, you know, and some of those images are worthy of putting somewhere, you know, so. Right. I mean, when you have so many images, they can all be working for you. If yes. you just think it through yeah. and decide how to present them and then decide what thread has to go to, to which market and how to contact. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Right. And people, people sometimes say, you know, like art storefronts, is it worth it? And um, like, have you sold a lot? And I'm like, wrong questions. Wrong That's questions. what people always, and I, I always use the field of dreams as an example, because I've had this question asked me for several years, you know, like, how do you, you know, how do you sell so much? And I'm like, 
I, you, you have to do the work. You yeah. can't, it's not the field of dreams. You can't build it and they just come because that's not mm -hmm. how it works. And mm -hmm. I don't care what you sell anything. And you nobody have to else do it. is going to do it for you no matter no, what anybody else no, says. No. And your, <laughs> your friends aren't your, your audience, your friends aren't your customers, your parents, mm -hmm. your family. They're not the ones you need to be, you know, they all love your stuff. I have a group of, you know, three, 400 people that I know from photography, but they're not my customers, right? Right. They're not my clients. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones buying my stuff. So it always amazes me that people don't see that part or understand that you, you have to still do the work. You have yeah. to find your audience and you have to find out and figure out the best way to market to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, tr it's tricky. Cause you know, like, I think I was talking to you the other day when I developed my, when I was uh, um, coaching voice, you know, to television news broadcasters, which I did uh, for 25 years. I developed my, my base. I knew someone in the industry. He introduced me around, but I mean, I went to every single um, broadcast conference in the country, like for years, I would go every year, not necessarily all of them every single year, but I always went to something every year and met people and went to the parties and pressed the flesh and blah, right. blah, blah. So then the question becomes, how do you do that online? Because we can't, do it the same way, yet it's the right. same process right. of meeting people and bonding with them and finding out what they need and how you can help them. And so just learning how, how right. to connect with those people and what, where, where like those mini conferences are in essence. Right. And which groups she should belong to, or maybe get into, or, right. you know, start. And then, and then it's a whole different thing. If you get into a group of people that are potential clients or customers, you're, you don't want to be in there trying to push your stuff. Cause that's not right. the reason for the group, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a balance to try to figure out how to connect with them in a way that gets them to get to your site or to get to the, the things that or you're trying get to them sell on a them call or, or get yeah. them in a chat or get right. them because like in the group, you're just there to be part of the group and offer right. whatever assistance and right. interest thoughts you can. But if somebody and you resonate, then you just, you take them out of the group. You, you don't have that. Yes. Right. Group. Right. You go have a chat or, right. or a phone call. Right. Yeah. It's yeah, it's an interesting thing. I don't know how we got off on this topic, but it's something <laughs> a lot of people a lot of people ask me about this and because you know they're like, I don't know, I might want to sell my work. And I'm right. like, okay. And when you think <laughs> about that, there's you know, everybody, everybody is a photographer. Everybody. So you think about the amount of work that's out there and trying to make yours stand out and trying to sell it is it's really a little crazy if you think about it. Like, why am I doing this? Not I sure. know it is nuts. I often tell people to start locally because, you know, depending Honestly, on Honestly, that's what I was told. And I, I didn't want to do that. And I didn't, and I probably should have, but. Well, you did, you know what? <laughs> you did a little doing bit, my own thing. <laughs> you did a little bit in Chicago. Cause you I did, I do. In that's, Chicago, that's true. Yeah. 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 Because where I live, there's, there's several art galleries, but people aren't coming to where I live for art. It just right. isn't, you know. Yeah. But yes, I have had pieces in, in galleries in Chicago. And right. So there's that. Yeah. Right. So that's pretty cool. Very good. Well, um, and that's a boy, that's a topic we could do a whole a whole yes. thing on. We may yes. have to one day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things too that I love, okay, two I, I want to put these together actually. So you're known in many circles for your architectural work, but you also do stunning landscape work. But the architect, but the architectural angle is present in both because it's kind of how you see, period. Yes. And I also believe, I mean, Mother Nature is like the ultimate architect. You know, if you think about the Fibonacci spiral and think about how things are created and, and the structure of, of nature and things and how they're yeah. made, it's, it's all very architectural if it you is. really think about it. So do you want to show, do you want to show some of your work? Um, yeah, I can. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, nope, you're fine. I don't. Well, you're getting that going. I'm going to just kind of jump over here to Facebook for a second. Do you want me to share okay. my screen? Um, oh, you. Yeah, you sure. Oh, yeah. It. I got to let on. you do that. Good. You guys can see that now, right? Yep. Let me close out this stuff. So, um, I and I just, I just popped into my website, into my fine art galleries. Um, and I have an architectural site that's color and black and white. So, and I, I you know, it's just, um, like this particular image was a, a specific moment where you either get lucky or you stand there and wait because this happens at the Milwaukee Art Museum all the time. Mm -hmm. 
you just happen to get the right person doing the right thing right you know in any moment um this this but you have an eye go back to that for a second you have an eye and this is this is a lot of times you know how people are always like how did you see that and like okay yes this happens all the time but the moment was this girl this woman is in black her elbows you know the angle of her arms and elbows her hair the shape of the phone the just everything reflects the architecture around it so how do you train yourself to see those moments do you know it's really funny because you're sitting there going the shape of her elbows and i'm like wow i never noticed that <laughs> <laughs> but see that's, that's i just kinda... this is like it's i try to explain stuff like this to people and it, it it's like i can't help it right it comes naturally to me i don't look for that i i must see it and feel it when it's there you know which causes me to to snap the photo at the time um but I, I'm not specifically standing there going, wait, oh, if she would bend her arms, like instead of having them this way, you know, that would be a better photo. Well, I mean, I think that goes back to, you know, I'm always, you know, me, I'm always going on about finding your artistic voice, but, and the personal, the personal path um, or part of the personal path to that is it's, this is like, I know I've known you for years and this is how you think. You think you like to put things in an order. You like yes. to have things organized. Yes. You like to, uh, you know, kind of put things in a sequence that you have a very, um, and it isn't restrictive. It isn't, you you know, it isn't like it has to be this way. It's not like that. It's just like (laughs) my husband might disagree with that. (laughs) Well, in, you know, in this whole realm, I know. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I tend to be a lot more Isadora Duncan. I'm just, wow. You know, I love that. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes I wish I were, I've actually learned a lot from you about that, about being a little more organized and letting things kind of bake and um, stuff like that. So I see that in your work. I mean, look at your backdrop. <laughs> I, well, and I, I picked that out specifically because it had an architectural feel to it. Yeah. The rest of the other stuff was all flowery and I'm not flowery. So. <laughs> yeah. And it, and you have that. And so you naturally recognize the moments when there's the kind of structure that you find pleasing yes. and it's really consistent throughout your work. So show a couple more architectural ones, because I think they're so beautiful. I love looking at them. But then then I want you to show some of your landscapes because okay. they have right. a similar feel. Oh, I'm that's so to. cool. That's uh, in Rotterdam. And I mean, again, it helps when you have architecture that's amazing, you know. Yeah. Um, but then you have Gothic. You know, this is pretty interesting architecture. You know, can I take something that's not. Uh, what do I got here? I mean that's something that's kind of an everyday thing, like in London, right? Can you make it be more interesting or be an architectural shot or even just corners of buildings and windows with reflections? You know, there's, this is, and this is one of the things I always say, there's more to what you see. Like when you initially see this building, you probably notice the corner and the windows, but if you stop and actually look a little bit further, you see the reflections in it. You know, and then then it becomes something different, and it it adds a depth, and it just makes it a little different than what you initially see in your head as a building with windows. Right. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's really, and it's and it really this is like the fine art. The difference between taking the picture of oh, here's a cool building with reflections, which is a sort of a general travelogish approach, which I'm not knocking. I'm just saying this right. is a fine art approach to that same moment where you go, I want to look. It's more specific. I want to look at the corners. I want to see what pleases me. Oh, look at the pattern. I love that repeating yes. pattern. Now, how much of that pattern does the thing right. that makes me happy snap? Right, right. And in this, in a case like that, I would be moving my lens around, you know, to, right. to get the right spot. Right. I mean, I do that with trees. Right. Same thing. Okay. Uh, the landscape. What uh, those are going to be kind of under travel. So, okay, I'm going to go big or go home, right? <laughs> because this yeah. is the, like epic landscape, uh, Antarctica. Um, I am also drawn to mountains. I've always been drawn to mountains. Yep. Um, so that Antarctica is amazing for that. Um, mm-hmm. I have a little bit of everything in this album, so bear with me. Uh, this is, again, it, it it's it's a place that's, just not describable 
you know, you can't, although I just shared a, a article I found on Lonely Planet by a guy who went there and described it very well and described I've the have, awe. You sent that yeah, to me. I a, haven't read it yet. I can't wait. A, he just did a really good job of everything that he really felt and, and saw when he went there because you don't expect it. And then you don't know what to do when you do get there. So these are kind of well, the landscape and, okay, types. So this, this ties in too with the other thing that I love when you talk about it, which, which you're really good at, um, which is, you know, sticking with your vision, no matter what, because when you're on a trip like this, you got a whole bunch of people shooting a certain way and the boat's pointing you a certain way. And there's a lot kind of asking you to do things in quote, a certain way. And you never do that. You always find a way to use the situation, not judge it, not be resistant to it, but find your own, let it take you to your own take. Right. And the, the best example I have of this is the first time I went to the Arctic. Um, it was part of a, um, there was a photography symposium attached to the expedition. And <clears throat> you're out on the water, sometimes two days at a time. And the same with the Arctic trip also, because it takes you two days to cross the Drake Passage. There isn't really anything to photograph when you're in the middle of an ocean, right? I mean, there's always something to photograph, if you ask me, but if it was um, me, I mean, I'd be photographing myself throwing up the whole. Way. I, have, I have pictures. Of, <laughs> I have pictures of the barf bags on the, you know, because ah, they they put it ah. every so often during the ship. So you know, there's stuff to shoot. But everybody's like, "Oh, birds! Oh, there's birds everywhere. We can play. We can photograph birds." And I'm like, "Oh my god, I don't want to photograph birds. I don't really care. Like, they're interesting because they're different, right? I've never yeah. seen the Arctic tern. I've never seen this kind of seagull or this kind of." whatever you know and i thought i and i suck at shooting birds and things like that so i you know there's a bird photographer and several other professional photographers who are like this is how you should do it this is what you should do you know i'm like okay i i have a few decent shots but i'm not going to stand here and take home 300 images bird shots of a seagull i'm just not right so then i started looking around at like what else is there you know i have images of details of the ship right? Like the deck right. chairs all stacked up which, with snow on them, like which makes kind of a cool black and white image. Um, then I started taking abstract water images, right? So I, I love those. Show a couple so, of those. Those are I'm so just, cool. Let me see if I have a... Um, I see one over there. I see one down like... Oh, there's those. like this one. Yeah, that one. I love that one. Oh, I love so that, that one. That was a blue sky, blue, white, puffy cloud day. And that was, you know, um, calm waters, basically. You know, I have ones from the Arctic trip where there, it's not calm and it's very dark gray, but there's tons of motion and splashing, you know, um, in the water. So right. it was it was like one of my mentors was on this trip also. And he said he said he watched me just find my stride, you know, because I was uncomfortable. You're with all these other people who are doing all this other stuff the same. And they're here. You know, they all want to learn. You know, we all there to learn. And I was just getting like, I cannot do this. this is not, and there's a certain you know, amount when of you're pressure. you're not true, yes, there, yeah. there is. Because then you feel like you're being like a rebel and you don't, you know, you're, you're not, you're too good to learn and, or whatever. Right. So eventually it was, you know, it, it was, there's me hanging my camera over the edge and shooting straight down and doing what I do, you know? Right. And then I, I just got comfortable with it. And then it was like, this is what I'm going to do because this is my trip also. Right. And I'll learn what I want to learn and what I can learn, but I'm still going to be true to who I am. And I'm still going to take the images that I see, you know, well, and I have and some bird images and that's yep. fine, but. And that's the know. thing I, that I find myself telling people who like to shoot a lot of different things and I can't find my voice and I know I need to pick a genre. I'm like, no, you need to find that thread of what it right. is you love, you know, that is very, but it has to be so damn specific about what it is you love because I always know no matter where you go, I can recognize a Lori Novak and you shoot a lot of different subjects, but you shoot it from this perspective that you have that is very recognizable no matter what you shoot. And I think and it, that's a superpower. It's funny because I couldn't tell you what that is myself. Most I of know us other can't. people see it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a huge compliment though. People know, you know. Yeah. I think sometimes, but. I think sometimes we don't necessarily know those things about ourselves. It takes someone else to Right. Say, hey, right. so we have some comments. Let's see. Loving the Antarctic 
Antarctica photographs. I love you, Lori. You're my mentor. <laughs> I love that. I love that you wrote oh, she's that. She's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then here in our chat, um, thank you, Cameron, for sharing all these links. Yeah. And it's like it flows, you know, how you flow and you wait for the shot. Landscape photographers do that too. I just, you know, as a group, generally, like landscape photographers get the part where you gotta wait. Yes. But then they walk away and I'm like, you waited for that. <laughs> right. I don't mean, I don't mean to put anybody down. No, I'm not and I, I, I but, totally understand that. Yeah. But seriously, I mean, like you want to get the epic shot, get it. That doesn't take very long. You may have to wait right. a while, but right. then what about the, what about the water shot? Like yours, like you walked away from Antarctica with such a plethora. It, it is like a, Penguins. you know, 500 page <laughs> book of images, of all different kinds. It could have been. They were all Antarctica, but they were like far away and up close and the bird and the people and the, you know, the whole thing, the book of the experience. See, and that's what, that's what, and you use this a lot as storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. We're photographers and we're storytellers. So when you're on a trip, you know, you want to be able to tell the whole story of the trip. Right. I, I said, it's like, I, I used this on something the other day. I was like, it's like people who take pictures of their food in a restaurant. But that's all they do is that's all you see so there's right. way more to that story what's the restaurant look like inside where is it what's the street look like outside it's the whole thing and when you're traveling especially you want to come home with that story in my opinion yeah. you know i remember you want to my be first, able that have yeah, all of it exactly my first trip to france was um for a voice job and I had just gotten my, it was back in my Canon day. So I got my Canon 5D2 and it was like, Ooh, and I was so excited. And we took the gear and my husband was along with me and we went out like till three in the morning. And I mean, we had an experience, like I did my job, which was right far as it was, which was great and different and interesting. And, you know, and just a really different kind of job when you get flown to Paris to do a voice job. <laughs> um, and then I, I had a particular idea in my mind of the kind of shots I wanted to get in Paris, but I kind of had doubts about my ability. So I kept trying, no matter where I went in Paris, I took the same picture. <laughs> so I came home with this cards full of the same freaking picture <laughs> all over Paris. And yet we had had this like the night that we went out after work and we were you know, we closed down the Louvre and I got this picture of the old, old part as the gates were shutting and they kicked us out because we, they were very nice, but we were the last people there. And then we went walking and we saw this amazing thing in the snow. And then we went and had, you know, what did we have? Pastries and wine and cognac at two in the morning in this little cafe. And then we missed the subway. So we had to walk the, you know, however many miles back to our, I mean, it was a night. And then the next day they were so fussy and worried that I had overtired myself and I might be too tired to work. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you high? <laughs> and uh, this was energizing to me. And out of all that, I came home with the same picture about 300 times. So 3, you weren't 000. there, you weren't there to photograph the trip. I mean, that no. wasn't your initial. So you, you got to experience everything though. That like, was, that trip was the one that changed every, that was 2010 right. and that changed everything for me. Um, in terms of travel, in terms of shooting a book, in terms of bringing home the whole experience. And and what did I think about the experience? Not with somebody else. Like I remember right. I was had somebody in mind that I want to get some shots like that. And I was shooting his <laughs> shots over yeah. and over and over. Yes. And that, that's something I, I was thinking about too, as we were talking about what we were going to discuss today is yeah. how you know, everybody wants to get those shots. You know, it seems like everybody wants to get those shots. And it's like, well, do some, do your own thing, right? You don't want to wear the same clothes as everybody else or the same car as everybody, else. you know, do your own thing. That's how you get the shots that are different. And, you know, I mean, I find myself going to some amazing places going, yeah, I, I got to get this shot. I just do. And it's the same well, one do. everybody else does. Right. And you do. Right. But how long does that take? 30 seconds? But you take it and then you move on. Yeah. And it, and it's, like, yeah. You're not going to stand there all day and take the same one over and over again, except I did that in Paris already. And I can tell you, <laughs> not, not that great. No. It was, uh, we all have our learning curves and our learning lessons. And it's funny. But you because, wouldn't be where you are today if you hadn't done that. Right. So it's and, part of and the, the truth. Part and of it was journey. funny, though, that I did that. I fell into that trap because. I've been photographing my whole life. I've been photographing my, I was grew up with a camera in my yeah. hands. My, 
my mother's parents. Okay. My mother was born in 1922. So they photographed her from the time she was a toddler forever. And her mother, her grandmother used to make all of her own clothes. She looked a bit like Norma Jean before she was (laughs) Marilyn Monroe, this tall, thin, gorgeous, full lipped beauty, you know, in the forties with her incredible suits and handmade clothing that were like out of Vogue magazine. It was incredible. They documented all that. So I grew up with a camera and we were documenting our life and our animals and the ranch and everything. And then you know, cut. And so like uh, this, that's how I spent all my life and developing my own work and stuff like this. Then I go to Paris and take the same picture (laughs) 5,000 times. I'm like, what's wrong with you? (laughs) So we all, we all learn. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. So going back to what you were saying about, you know, you said I was, we were talking about, um, oh, we were going to talk a little bit about gear too, which is really counterintuitive, but I think is, I think is an important part of this conversation from this perspective, because a lot of people talk about gear and what the best gear is and what lens do you use and how much, and I know in landscape, I'm, (laughs) I'm always getting the, you know, the frantic texts and emails. I don't know what to pack. What lenses do I take? (gasps) You know, well, if you have to ask that question, you have too many lenses, right? (laughs) That's how, that's how I think. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and the thing of it is, you're always afraid you're going to miss out. And the truth is, I remember I had, okay, so training horses, I trained horses for 45 years. So my teacher who taught me everything I know about training, I, I had that same angst about my horse who was like my best horse ever. And I was so nervous about making training mistakes that I could hardly function. And he sat me down and he goes, okay, just figure you're going to make mistakes. Just plan on it. Plan on all the mistakes. You're going to make them. I'll help you fix them. Well, now let's move on. And, and my feeling is if you limit your lenses, you're going to wish you had another lens at some point, just, you know, know that in advance plan to get over it, you know, you know, say, Oh, you silly Manili and work (laughs) with what you have, because it'll make you a better artist. It'll make you see better. You'll go deeper and you'll have a lot more fun because you're not going to miss everything because you're fishing around in your stupid bag right? or, you know, some other piece of gear. Or you're in pain because you don't want to walk another mile with 8,000 pounds on your back. Yeah. 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 I, I talk like, you know, I knew this all along, but you know, how did I learn that? <laughs> I by, know how you By doing it. that. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like to carry extra stuff, period. So like, I'm the person like, even, you know, growing up, I'm like, I don't want to carry a purse. Give me, give me, you know, I put my stuff in my pockets. I've, so for me, I've never wanted all the gear. I've never wanted to carry all that stuff. Um, and to this day, I still only have, I, I have two lenses that I use. I have four lenses. I have a 50 and a hundred also. And the 50 probably, I don't know if it even works anymore. It hasn't been used in so long because it's not something I use for what I do. And right. I have, I have the macro lens, which I do play with. Um, but otherwise I have a, a four, uh, 17 to 40 and a 100 to 400. And I shoot with the 100 to 400 probably 90% of the time. That's a you great know, lens. Depending on where I'm at, it depends, you know, obviously in places like where there's epic landscapes and mountains and things you want to get, um, use the wide angle too. But right, um, shooting architecture, shooting in the cities, I'm, I'm, I almost don't even take any, I almost don't even take my bag. A lot of times I'll be like, you know what, I should just leave it all at home and just carry my camera and my lens. And that's it. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting on that page too. It, it just really in landscape, it depends on where I'm going, you know, right. the scope. So I have to do a fair bit of planning in terms of what's the scope and what's the distance and, and why am I going and what do I want to walk right. away with and, right. and, you know, hone it down. I know when I, my last uh, artist voice retreat in Italy, I was like, okay, I got to follow my own advice advice because I still, you know, I'm the same as everybody else. I sit down (laughs) and I go, I want to take this and I want to take this. And I'm like, I just, I let myself go there because, you know, I pat myself on the head over here. Isn't she cute? (laughs) So cute. You're so funny. And then I went, all right, did a lot of research, got on Google earth and looked at where we were going. And, and I went, all right, what do I want this trip to be about? what do I want to feel and sense and experience and what distance am I from all of it? And what do I absolutely need? And so I did the thing where I took, so I took my 
Fujifilm X-T3. Why didn't I take a GFX? I can't remember. I think I maybe just didn't have it at that point, or I knew I wanted to take a long lens because I knew there was going to be some range once we got in the Dolomites that I'd want it for a few things. But I took my 18 to 135 and used that 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. I took my um, little kit 55 to 200, which is like in full frame equivalent 300 at the, at the far end. And it's sharp end to end and it's wonderful. And that was really all I needed. But you know what? I did the same thing everybody does, which is, oh, I'm going to be in Venice. I should bring the wide angle. Should I not? Should I? Should I? And my 10 to 24 isn't that big. And I had room and I threw it in. Right. And I was like, did you use it? No. (laughs) You know how I used it? About the fourth day I went, I feel so stupid that I brought this lens. I should take it out and use it once. (laughs) And I did. And I threw all the images away because I didn't like any of them. They just didn't do the job. I mean, I had to, I had it, I had decided, I don't know all the shots that are going to happen, but I, I knew what I wanted to show up with. I knew what I wanted to capture. And I knew this lens had enough range to do it. And it's, and it's a beautiful lens. So really I shot the 18 to uh, 135 Venice, Burano, everywhere we went. And then one morning sunrise that we did up on a, one of the refugios up, up there in the uh, Italian Alps, I, I used my 55 to 200 and carved those gorgeous little mountain, you know, chunk right. downs that right. are so gorgeous. Right. And and otherwise, like you, it was you, 18 to 135 the whole time because right. I could shoot faux macro that way. I can right. shoot everything. And if it if it comes to it, like you did in Zion, you can shoot a pano with multiple images. Exactly. If you really want that wide shot, that's all you have to do. And I do right. that with my 100 to 400 or my macro lens. I use my macro lens that way too sometimes. Mm-hmm. So you don't necessarily have to have that lens with but I think what you said a lot of what you said about knowing what you want in advance what you want to capture and how you want to capture it will help you decide to bring those lens. but I I think that people don't necessarily know that enough about themselves about how they shoot or they don't stop to think about it or or learn that about themselves and their photography like I know this about myself I know that I'm going to take my 100 to 400 and that's going to be the lens that gets used the most. Even if right. I have four other lenses in my bag, I know that's how I shoot all the time. So, you know, I think that people don't always know themselves, you know, take a minute. If you use Lightroom, go look at what you, what lens you, you can look up how much, how many times, right. you know, what, how many images are shot with a particular lens in your Lightroom catalog. And, and you or, might be surprised. Yeah. What or if, you you're, all the time. if you're not sure, like I have people reach out to me sometimes and say, I'm just not sure what, you know, I have these lenses. What do you think I should do next? And, um, you know, I try to find out a little bit more about kind of where they're gravitating. Cause you know, in the beginning, it's hard to know. And then like, even recently I recommended the 18 to 135 based on what I was told about what, what this person was looking at, because if you, if you, t- if you get a lens like that, especially if it has good resale value, <laughs> which that one does, <laughs> um, it's, you know, then go explore and find out right. because your results are what will tell you what to do next. Right. So you got to get in and get dirty and try things. I mean, that's how you found out you should probably shot. You probably shot, I bet it's, so you shoot Canon. So yeah. you probably use the 24 to 70 a lot and went, you know mm-hmm. what? No, in the beginning. I've only I've only ever had. Um, okay, so when I very first think about the got, beginning. Well, the very first DSLR I had because I I shot film. I mean, I've had a camera like oh that's right yeah. So if you have I a lot of experience, 10, you right? Know. Well, then you know um, things. But people who start right no, and you usually know usually your kit lens is usually like an eighteen to fifty five. Yeah, right? that's generally what comes on um, your first camera when you get it. The DSLRs that are out, you know, right. Um, and then you want, you want more reach than that usually is how it progresses because Mm -hmm. 18 to 55, isn't that much. Right. And somebody just in the comments said 70 to 300 for me. That's what I, that's what I shot with, with my can't, my film camera. Yeah. And you, and that's probably, well, that was full frame. I believe what he's talking about is full frame. So, you know, 55 to 200 because you know, in a ASP APSC sensor, Right. is about that range, which is really great. It covers the 7D. Oh, so that's that's crop sensor too. 
So he's shooting at either way. It still puts you in a range that um, you can work with in most environments. Right. right. And then, uh, and then go from there. So the point that we're really making here is um, get in, get dirty, use whatever you have, and then start like, it's, it's sort of like being a little bit of a ninja in terms of, all right, how do, how much do I love this? Is this what I love? Do I want to be closer? Do I want to pull things in more? Do I want to, you know, get wider? Like what, what am I kind of craving? What am I feeling like? And, and let the results determine Mm -hmm. your gear and your vision determine your gear, right? Not the other way around. Right. Yeah. I don't know why that's so hard to grasp, but there's so many people out there with so many opinions. Eh, you need to have this lens and this lens. Well, and you know, it's marketing. That camera. You know, it's also marketing. Camera companies are are in the business of selling equipment and gear. Mm-hmm. And they're, you know, you should have this. Well, just for, for another example, right? 100 to 400 is a wildlife lens. I don't shoot wildlife, you know, but that's what it's marketed shoot people. as. You photograph right, people. Yeah. That's kind of wildlife. <laughs> 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 You know, so it's it's that that side of it too. I think is we're we're kind of inundated with those messages. Yeah. Well, but. and it's interesting too because you know I'm a professional Fujifilm X photographer. I I'm an ambassador of the brand, and I absolutely 100 percent like. I mean, the congruent part of that is that I chose Fujifilm before I was ever that because right. it fits my vision because it fits everything about it was what I was looking for, and I tried when I was switching from. Um, was to, well, it's a long story. I won't go yeah. into it. But anyway, when I was looking to switch, I tried a number of different brands because I had this laundry list of things like these are musts. These are nice to haves. And I was almost out of ideas until somebody suggested Fujifilm. And I was like, oh, my God, this is me. They built this for right. me. <laughs> so, you know, that and, it's and it, personal cameras are personal. Really- and I, I don't I don't think that. Um, you know, that's the mentality that you have to kind of think about. It's personal, you know? So, it and then by work. the same token, if you, you know, like uh, I've done this on retreats with everyone, uh, not with everyone, but, you know, with certain people um, who get in a kind of a rut of this is how I shoot. Like, you know, I always shoot with my hundred to 400 or I always shoot with my wide angle or I always is always scary and dangerous. Yes. And so I think we had a, an evening, because I always would, you know, we'd have these little events where we'd photograph things that we would normally never photograph. Like we had a cooking class at one of them. And then we photographed, we were able to go in the kitchen of this, you know, beautiful boutique hotel. And um, <clears throat> and we pho- photographed as we were making our own food, but also as the chef was making his food photograph. Mm-hmm. So this person is like a total wine aficionado, food aficionado. And he was going to come in with his usual lens and do his usual thing. I said, no, put on your macro, handhold it, no tripod and photograph your experience, photograph the stuff that you go, Ooh, I love that. Right. Cause he loves all that stuff. So his, <laughs> his images were fascinating and they were great. And, but he's like, I feel so awkward. You know? <laughs> he's a really good photographer, Yeah, but he, you get, you get into these, um, Loretta Young was a was an actress in the 40s. And when I was in acting school, people used to always tell the Loretta Young story, which was she used to in interviews talk about when they say, you know, your method and, and how you act and how you prepare. And, and one of the things that she always said she did, I don't know, I wasn't there, but she said she never put her makeup on because in the 40s, they put on makeup every day, you know, full on camera makeup. She never did it in the same order two days in a row. Because it gets you start- out of your... Yeah, because right. she said as an actor, anything you do by rote is yeah. is death to an actor because yeah. that, some part of you just goes to sleep. <clears throat> and that's and true in anything, I think. I think it is too. I yeah. think it's true with photography. Um, I'm just seeing some comments here in the chat about looking at Fujifilm after using Nikon, Canon, Sony. So that, you know, that's the, the brand discussion. Um, yeah, blown away when you saw the results on the Fujifilm X series. So, and then there's, you know, in any camera brand, like in Fujifilm, we have the X series, which are the smaller, you get right. the smaller cameras and then the GFX, which is large format. It's much bigger and heavier, but it does a different thing. Yeah. So like Amazing. people are like, oh, I don't know, should I get a big one? And I'm like, it depends. Oh, or should I get the 50S or the 100S? And I'm like, well, let's talk about what your goal is here. Yeah. <laughs> and you want a new computer. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I would love a GFX, right? Yeah. Like I got to shoot one with you in Tahoe there 
yeah. for a couple of days. Well, with you, the 50S would be like without having to upgrade your computer. But the thing is, they don't make 100 to 400 equivalent. Right. And I mean, I, it's, it's, not, it's not something that I, I would work for me at the moment. Right. You know? So right. as, well, as it beautiful would, as I would, it would be really cool to see what you would create with a GFX though. I have to say because of the way it sees and because of the way you see, I think right. that would be a really interesting. Um, Maybe I should rent one for a while combination. It would be interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the biggest telephoto it has is hundred to 200, which is. That's fine. Uh, it's 0.79. I think, I don't know what the math is 0.79. Anyway. It's, it's about that. And um, so it's, it's like a mid telephoto, not extreme. And I find, I find it, you know, I have found like, cause I beta test a lot of these cameras mm -hmm. and lenses and create images for different projects and um, launches and things like that. And so, you know, for instance, the 250, uh, the GFX and the GF 250. Now the 250 is I mean, the most gorgeous lens, it is the most gorgeous lens, but what I discovered talk about a blind spot is they sent it to me and they said, okay, we want this, we want landscape images with this because they'd mostly been promoting it as a, as a portrait lens, which it's gorgeous. Right. So I take it out in landscape and I'm like, okay, these pictures are gorgeous, but how in the heck can this be a landscape lens? I was so, I was mad for a week. <laughs> I had it for a few weeks, but I was mad for the first week because I'm like, how am I supposed to create landscape images with a 250 <laughs> prime? And then I was, and then, you know, after a while, like, you know, I kept thinking I would start having ideas and I wasn't. And I finally had to stop and go, I think you're going about this the wrong way. <laughs> and I had to go, what I had to say, cause I always talk to my gear. I was asking it questions <laughs> and I said, so what do you see? Like, never mind what I see. Right. What do you see? And right. they started going out and just asking it what it saw. And it started showing me what it saw. And I was like, I never look at this focal length. I skip right. it right. in my mind. Right. I go from here to far yeah. away and I never even look in the 250 range. And I was like, wow. Wow. Was that ever a, kind of like a kick in the ass for Lesson. me? Yeah. And it, and it, and then, well, then I couldn't stop seeing it that distance. And it was <laughs> just stunning what I was able to do with it. But it, it took that first week of just going, I hate this. Why are they asking me to do this? <laughs> I mean, to be perfectly honest, it isn't always the most fun when you have to do something that, you know, you're like, oh, really? Well, you have a different mindset too, when you know you have to create something and, yeah. you know, you're but, not just. But, and people say, you know, I, like I've had the argument, like, I'm sure you've heard this too, that. Well, it's fine to shoot what I like, but my client wants this. And I'm like, they want your Me. take on that. On that, right. Exactly. And to know how to do that. It's, is it's like, like people gold. have asked me to do portraits. Um, one in particular was a girl's mom who um, her daughter dances in Nashville for the Nashville Ballet. And I have a background in ballet and she knew my photography work. She knows my architecture work she knows and that's the reason why she asked me to take photos of her daughter so we went down into the city and took photos of her daughter in the city so i have a dancer but they're also in an architectural context many of them with the city surroundings you know so right no i don't want to take portraits unless you're asking me for the right reason you know i don't want to shoot your wedding well, and you could have <laughs> but, just as you know, easily said i don't shoot dancers because right, you know we I, all think of right. dance photography and people who shoot dancers in cities and other places yes. and you're like i don't do that but what what you did which is what a lot of people don't it's like the lens you know figure out how the lens sees figure out how you see put right. it together and it was i saw your images they were so unique and so gorgeous and just like, you just got to commit, you got to, you know, go right. face first into right. it. And she knew too. And I've had, you know, I always, people who ask for portraits, I'm like, you're familiar with my work, right? <laughs> you uh -huh. know, so you don't have to, and, and you don't have to say yes to everybody. You know, if they're a client that keeps asking you for things you don't want to do, then you're, they're not the right client. Right. I know yeah, that from like, voiceover, you know, I mean. I've, I've, I've quit a couple of clients who just kept asking, we, we, we love your voice, but then they would want to change everything about it. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't love it that okay. much. And I really don't love you. So, <laughs> so yeah, you got to be sort of discerning, but I think this, this business of, um, I always say photographer, know thyself. 
Because, and that's, I was just going to say too, it's be true yeah. to yourself. Yeah. And say more about that. Um, I, I feel like I've always been that way. So a lot of yeah. people struggle with that. I think just in general in life. Um, but I've always yeah. been, you know, I'm who I am. And if you don't like me, I don't care uh, too bad. Um, you know, and I'm going to, I'm fortunate because I was raised to believe and do what I want basically, I mean, within reason, I still got in trouble for doing things I wasn't supposed to do. But um, I was given the opportunity and the the like, I wasn't given any like walls, you know, or you're supposed to be in this box and this right. is what you're supposed to do. So I feel very fortunate that that I have that way of thinking because it's allowed me to do what I do and and have the outlook in life and the outlook in how I shoot and what I shoot. Um, that's a part of how I create what I create is because right. I have that open perspective and right. a different view on things than a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, and you really have to be open. You got to have the softer side of Sears open along with a, you know, a steak knife in your other hand. Yes. You got to be fierce. <laughs> you got to be fierce about standing by, you know, how you see and still stay open. So you stay permeable, but well defended. Yeah. Flow, flow. Yep. Very Tai Chi. Yes. So I want, we're God, I can't even believe we've been at this for we about an hour. Cruised. Whoa, that's fast. <laughs> so what, so tell people where to find you. Right. I wanted to ask you just real well, briefly yeah. about your, um, your C tour. Right. Because have, uh, uh, you have that coming up and I want, I want people to understand the incredible, um, what you, what you offer them. I mean, to be in your presence when you're photographing <laughs> is I, incredible as well as to get to go and see the things that you see. I have a, a guy actually called me one day and was going to be in town for a business. And, and I met him and he was like that. I learned more from those two hours of walking around the city with you than, and we didn't walk around the city. We walked like maybe, I don't know, probably not even a mile of where we were, but yeah. Um, so I have a sea a tour Chicago fall. It's September 1st through 4th. So it's four days. There's, I have, plans but not you know not totally this is what we do every minute of every day um, right because because you flow you you go with, and you, and you can't what is yeah mm -hmm. there's certain things obviously we do a tour inside the rookery building which is famous for the spiral staircase mm, um I love and those then, then we do the architectural river tour which is amazing and i do it all the time because you see a different perspective of the city from the river um, and you're, you know, you're down like on the river and seeing the buildings from different ways on, right. the, on the river. Um, and we just kind of wander, you know, I mean, I have specific areas we wander to. We go to the Bean because that's, you know, obviously people want to come to Chicago and see certain things. So we, I make sure we do those. But I also make you work for the Bean because, you know, you get your big shot of the Bean like everybody has. But like we we're talking, it's been shot and photographed billions of times. So like... Right. How do you do it differently? And those are the kind of things that I try to help people with during my tours. Um, you know, take your shots, take your, you know, whatever it is you want, and then let's work a little harder and find something else. Um, it's so, so valuable it, because in a short amount of time, you can take people places that they can use forever. Yeah. Like, I love that. It's almost like building obsolescence, building the need for what we do into an obsolete, you know, it's obs obsolete. Now the desire to maybe be with us or be with you or take, like, I want to do what we did in Chicago, but I want to do it in, you know, Amsterdam right. um, is totally legit. But to a lot of times, a lot of times people make you feel like you can't do it without them. That's like a, a way to build uh, longevity into your oh, teaching. right. You know what yeah, I mean? I but guess. I love the way you do it, which is you really freely give the information so people it's can like run with it. It's like raising your kids and going, okay, get out of the house now. <laughs> right. Like, I don't want you hanging around right? me. Yeah. We may want to take a trip together. We may not. That's good right. if you want to come with me, but I don't want you to need me because that's no. just weird. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm the same but way. But it's fun. But I I mean, that's what the joy of it for me, though, is like in the last time I did a Chicago tour, it was like, uh, it's people watching me where my lens is pointed and being like, what are you looking at? And then they'll, right. they'll be like, oh my God, I never, you know, they don't exactly, it, they're seeing something that they wouldn't have noticed before. And it's and just, I love that. I love you being can't able unsee to, it. You can't right, unsee it yes. and you can't unsee the way. It's like seen. when you start seeing faces and things, they're everywhere and you can't stop seeing them. So tell people, I'm going to put it in, I'm going to put the oh, links right. in the post, but tell people where to find it. 
So I'm uh, that's at seewithlori.com, S-E-E, with Lori, L-A-U-R-I, dot com. Um, you can also go to laurinovak.com and you can find it there too. You'll find it mm-hmm. through there from tours and mentoring. Good deal. Um, Lori Novak photo is my social media tag. And you do mentorships and you have a mentoring. session program if people mm-hmm. just want to have like an intensive time yeah, with you. Yeah. And uh, and that's hugely valuable. Also, I've been watching some of your students over the past couple of years, just like, oh my God, it isn't even the same person. So it's, it's really, it's great stuff. So, um, and it's a, it's a passion. I enjoy helping people. And like I said, I like seeing them like, you like, you like to see their light bulb go, you know, like, isn't that the oh, best? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. It really is. I know I'm watching that in my, you know, artist voice, you guys all heard right. me talk about it. Well, that's going on now. And it's, uh, I'm just watching it. It's, it's the first time we've done it online and I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. It's amazing what I'm seeing. Um, and I also wanted to let cool. you guys know that I am teaching a gear. I'm teaching a gear Yay. class <laughs> in the upcoming Kelby One Live uh, gear conference. And you can also, so you can find that whether it's on my Facebook uh, profile or on Instagram or wherever you can find it in my link tree, which is, you know, in the bio or the intro of my, my profile. And then my website's karenhutton.com and karenhuttonart.com. Um, to check out all the rest of it. So I hope you do. And I hope you guys found this uh, as much fun and valuable. This is, this is gold. Thanks, Lori. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.